Hi, I'm Shane. And I'm Miranda. We're Chicky. Join us as we undertake our biggest road trip to date, five months around Australia in a four-wheel drive. After a year of closed borders due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were finally able to travel from New Zealand to our closest neighbour, my home country of Australia. Each episode will take you to a different region in this diverse continent and get up close to its unique wildlife, camping in the outback and Aussie bush. If you ever wanted to explore Australia, this series is for you. In this episode, we head to Australia's third largest island, Kangaroo Island, where we tackle sand dunes and get up close to its abundant wildlife. We explore its pristine coastline and spectacular natural stone structures, including the famous Admiral's Arch and remarkable rocks for the most spectacular sunset. We put on our hiking boots and hit trails filled with wildlife, getting closer than comfort in some instances before revealing remote beaches littered with caves waiting to be explored. Leaving the wilderness behind, we visit the more populated eastern part of the island, learning of its early days of settlement and colonisation. Before saying goodbye to this amazing place and heading along the southern coast on our way to Victoria. Join us on Global Travel Stories. Great. On this trip so far, we've been forced to throw out four bottles of honey at state borders and entering into Kangaroo Island was no different, even though it's not its own state, still you can't bring in your own honey. So I did a little bit of research and found out the reason why is because Kangaroo Island itself has the uh, world's most purest population of honeybees. Which is pretty special and unique so bringing honey has a way of potentially contaminating either way though we are going to get ourselves some honey here on kangaroo island it's supposed to be some of the best honey in the world so there is a plus side a bright side to all of this we are at clifford's honey farm in kangaroo island let me try some fresh honey We ended up sticking around a little longer than we thought. We had a good chat to the lady working here. I think her name was Jenny. And uh, I ended up getting some honey wheat ale and Miranda got the... Jenny's fa famous ice cream. Honey ice cream. Honey ice cream. Yep. There you go. How was it? So good. <laughs> so good. Alrighty. Cool. So now we're going to reserve our campsite and then check out the seals at Vivone Bay. So we're heading down to Seal Bay right now. We have to sort of get in before it closes at 4 p.m. Just saw a uh, fairy run. Uh, superb, superb fairy, fairy run. run. There you go. I knew you were going to correct me there. <laughs> Miranda's the bird maniac. <laughs> it came so close to us, like right up to our feet. It was so curious. She loved it. It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so we are going to check out the seals at Seal Bay. Contrary to its name, Seal Bay is home to Australia's third largest sea lion colony, with a population of around 800 sea lions. Both part of the pinniped family, sea lions tend to appear taller and more slender in stature due to their ability to walk tall on their larger fins.
Access to the Seal Bay Conservation Park is now managed to prevent stress on the sea lion colony as visitor numbers increased. They have created a boardwalk which can take you down to the viewing platforms to view the sea lions at a safe distance without interference. So that was pretty spectacular and uh, despite its name Seal Bay is actually home to the most accessible sea lion colony in Australia. Uh, most of the sea lion colonies do sit offshore on smaller islands and it kind of looked like all the sea lions were lazing about and having a bit of a snooze and the reason why they do that is because they are actually really tired. They spend two to three days at sea hunting and they can drift off or swim off to up to 100 kilometers south of Kangaroo Island. So they spend a lot of time out at sea and then when they get back it's pretty much time to rest up. This colony here supports about a thousand sea lions and it is one of the largest colonies in the country. Uh, their numbers are declining unfortunately so that is why it is very important to keep these places well protected and this actually has the highest level of protection that a marine environment can have in Australia so no fishing, nothing allowed off the coast here which is pretty awesome. Alrighty, Miranda, where are we? Little Sahara sand dunes. What are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna check out the dunes first and maybe rent a snowboard or a uh, sandboard. Here we go. First time on the sand dunes. Yeah! Little Sahara is a naturally occurring inland dune field around 2.5 square kilometres in size with the tallest dune being 70 metres above sea level. This site was classed as a significant Australian heritage geological monument in 1979. <laughs> oh. You got it, keep going. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> So we're at the Western KI Caravan Park. We've just sort of stopped in our spot for the evening and we heard some grunting in the trees and looked around. How many koalas did we see, Miranda? Well, five. depends. <laughs> yeah, five, because if you count the joeys. Yeah, so. little joey inside the, uh, the mother's pouch in one of them. It's really, really cool. And we only walked like a minute, so that's straight from our campsite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy. We've got some plans this afternoon. What are they, Miranda? going to Flinders Chase National Park. There's a few walks that we'd like to do there, so check it out. Yeah, we're gonna go out and see the, is it the Admiral's Arch, is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. There's quite a few things to see there. The island's koala population was introduced in the 1920s when 18 were moved there from Victoria in an attempt to recover the species because numbers across Australia had been reduced by hunting for the fur trade. The koala population on the island was thriving and numbered almost 50,000 up until the devastating 2020 bushfires which almost burnt half of the island. Unfortunately, 
The fires resulted in up to an 80% loss of the population, and now there are only an estimated 8,500 koalas remaining. So we're doing Becky's Lagoon Walk, which is just off our campground here. And we've already spotted a koala in the distance on the loop walk. So yeah, let's see what else we can see. It's a bit of a nature walk and you can see all these beautiful wildflowers in bloom right now. Absolutely stunning. Check out the size of these grass trees. I just learned that they were called yakka. Yeah, so I think they're a little bit different to the grass trees we're used to. God, they're much bigger. They're like colossal grass trees. The lagoon adjacent to the Kangaroo Island Caravan Park was full of wildflowers and wildlife. Among the lilies and kangaroo apple flowers in full spring bloom, we came across the Australian coot, the yellow-faced spoonbill, black swans and the black-fronted dotterel. Upon leaving the lagoon walk, we stumbled upon some resident Cape Barren geese and the Kangaroo Island subspecies of kangaroo, which has thicker fur than its mainland counterpart. We took a short drive out to Hanson Bay, where we encountered our first Rosenberg goanna. Slight change of plans. Uh, we're down here at Hanson Beach. Beautiful. Uh, we're gonna have a little bit of a picnic down here actually. It's getting nice this afternoon. The original plan was to sort of go through the Flinders Chase National Park. Some of the hiking trails we'd planned to hike tomorrow were actually destroyed due to the bushfires that uh, occurred last year, January 2020. really to spend 
exploring the area in the National Park, Flinders Chase National Park, because the sunsets here are supposed to be fantastic. And tomorrow, being our only other day in the area, is supposed to be raining for most of the day. So we thought we'll take the opportunity now, we'll go check out the National Park. Uh, right now we're at a place called Weir's Cove, I think it is. It's an old cottage or ruins here, apparently. It's pretty cool. I think that's what this is. Then we're going to Admiral's Arch and also the Remarkable Rocks. So we're seeing it all. God, that looks spectacular. I think we chose the right day. So the ruins up here were for the lighthouse keepers. I'm going to check out the lighthouse in a moment. And it was built in 1907 and lasted up until the 1930s and everything that they had supply wise was brought up these giant cliffs here by rope like a flying fox they would basically use these supplies over a three month period it's a long amount of time between shopping it's kind of cool The Cape du Codic Lighthouse was constructed between 1906 and 1909 and was the 15th lighthouse to be built on the South Australian coast. So we're doing the Cape du Codic. I'm going to try and pronounce that. It's French, so I'm not French. But uh, we're doing the loop right now and we're going to end up down at Admiral's Arch. New Zealand fur seal, also known as the long-nosed fur seal, inhabit the waters of southern Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand fur seals can be distinguished from sea lions by their pointy nose and smaller size. Fur seals also tend to be found on rocky shorelines, whereas sea lions prefer sandy beaches. The fur seal diet consists mainly of octopus, squid, fish and birds. Some fur seals around the southern ranges have been known to eat penguins. Admiral's Arch in Flinders Chase National Park is a natural rock bridge created by thousands of years of erosion. The viewing platform is a great place to observe the fur seal colony. fur seals can dive longer and deeper than any other fur seal, diving up to 15 minutes, reaching impressive depths of up to 380 meters. kind of bizarre. We're at uh, the Remarkable Rocks here on Kangaroo Island. It's pretty much the main tourist attraction. Sunset is the best time. We've had nothing but rain all week and we've finally got beautiful clear skies and there's not one other person here. If you have a look at the car park, there is no one, just us and a couple of kangaroos that <laughs> were in the car park. But it is kind of bizarre right now. 
South Australia is opening their borders to Victoria after the long drawn out COVID pandemic um, in Victoria. So they'll be opening up in about a week, which is when we leave the state. So when everyone rushes in, we'll be rushing out. Hopefully that's the plan. The remarkable rocks in Flinders Chase National Park are unique granite boulder formations composed of black mica, bluish quartz and pinkish feldspar covered in orange lichen. Over a course of 500 million years, natural elements such as rain, wind and crashing waves resulted in the formations of these impressive and unusually shaped sculptures. Remarkable rocks, what do you think Chicky? Oh! It's very windy. Sunrise and sunset are the best times to visit the remarkable rocks due to the way the lighting reflects off the boulders. sun began to lower, we set out to find the best place for dinner and to witness the sunset. This is our dinner spot for sunset. Look at this. That's amazing. Best sunset spot in the world right now. <laughs> Watching the sun dip into the Southern Ocean, the colors filled the sky like a painted backdrop, taking in potentially our favorite sunset of the whole trip. Woken during our sleep by a sound that seemed to come from a worse nightmare. That koala sounds right next to our tent. Jesus. Alright, that is the sound of a koala. <laughs> Yeah, there's a koala right there. God. That is a loud sound. I've never seen him so active. Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. Scary sound. We headed early to the northwestern region, one of the most remote parts of Kangaroo Island.
So we're about to do the ravine hike down to a beach full of beautiful caves that we'll go and check out. We weren't actually planning to originally do this hike. We actually planned to do a whole bunch of other little hikes throughout uh, Flinders Chase National Park, but uh, most of them were all closed down, unfortunately, due to the massive wildfires that this park experienced back in January 2020, last year. And you can still see the charred remains of a lot of the trees around here. It was devastating. The whole park itself had pretty much burnt right down and it obviously took a huge toll on the native wildlife in the area, which was well broadcast around the world. It was really, really devastating. What we're seeing right now is a lot of the revival from that, which is wonderful. You know, a lot of these trees are adapted to thrive on fire, like your grass trees over here as well known as the yak of these ones, the big giant tall ones, kind of crazy. And some of the wildlife is starting to recoup, but the problem is that these wildfires are becoming more and more common. We're getting drier and drier and hotter and hotter seasons, so a lot of people are getting really concerned about the future of places like this and the biodiversity that it holds. We're going through right now, it is spectacular. You can see all these sort of flowers starting to bloom up, which is really, really nice. And we are in the peak of spring, so it is lovely. It's been a really, really nice drive out here, actually. I'm guessing that's the ravine down there. Enjoying the trail so far, Chicky? Yeah, it's pretty cool. What do you like most so far? Um, well, we saw quite a few crimson rosellas, which were beautiful. The crimson rosella is a parrot native to eastern and southeastern Australia. These vibrant parrots can commonly be found in mountain forests or gardens where they can forage in trees, bushes, and on the ground for fruits, seeds, berries, nuts, and a wide variety of plants. My theory is, is that they're echidna holes because echidnas love to dig. Um, so that's what I think they are. I can't imagine them being anything else. So hopefully we see one. <laughs> so you really got to watch where you're walking here. Um, not only are there rocks everywhere, but also as well, you got to keep an eye out for these little ants called jack jump ants. As kids, we called them Hoppy Joes, and they were kind of like the bane of our existence, you know. Every once in a while, you'd be playing in the sand pit, and all of a sudden, you'd get stung by one of these things, and they have big, giant mandibles on them, and they would cause excruciating pain. And these ones here are red, which is a little bit different. The ones we had were black and orange, or black and green. All right, Chiki, what have we got here? Got a Rosenberg guana, and it doesn't seem to want to move off the trail. I got, like... <laughs> this close to him before realizing he was even there and he just didn't even care he still doesn't he's not afraid of me he's gonna have to be mightier do i just walk around him? The abundance of wildflowers had drawn insects, which in turn had lured goannas to the area.
the people we spoke to yesterday who recommended this hike told us to take our torches because there are some awesome caves to check out. Well, we forgot our torches. Um, we do have lights in our iPhones. I don't know how well that's gonna do, but you can already see some indentations and caves in the cliffs up here. I'm not 100% sure what this is, but it looks like limestone to me. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's limestone. Looks like the cave they were talking about. Looks like the cave. Oh, yeah. Pure darkness. Oh, this is cool. So this is cool massive. <laughs> Look up this way. <laughs> Stalactites right here. Yeah, stalactites right up there. They're like actual columns. So that cave is massive. So unsuspecting when you see it from the outside. It just looks like this little crack in a cliff. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's awesome. It's starting to rain now. All right, we're gonna head back. So behind me there we have the Cape Border Lighthouse, which was built in 1858. It was basically manually operated up until 1989, and it is the third oldest lighthouse in South Australia. Pretty cool. trees. I've got Miranda here for scale, the size of this thing. Overhead, we watched as Australia's largest species of eagle, the wedgetail, soar above. The journey back at dusk was a cautious challenge, with kangaroos waiting at every turn. The serenity of sunset caught us off guard for the gale force winds that rocked us in our rooftop tent during that night. So, 
this morning is a little bit of a shambles. Um, we didn't get much sleep last night. The wind uh, almost hit gale force, or it did some gusts for gale force over 50 kilometers per hour, and we didn't get much sleep at all. How many hours sleep do you think you got? Uh, probably about two. <laughs> two or three from around. I got a little bit more, but it wasn't great either way. Woke up with the bottom half of the actual um, rooftop tent flapping up and down, like the ladder lifting because of the gust of the wind, which was really, really scary. We're down here at Western River Free Camping Area. This is where we were going to camp last night. We're filming inside because it's just so windy. Um, it's essentially become a big giant wind tunnel and we don't really want to go through what we did last night. So we're going to sort of drive around and see if we can find a place that's a little bit more sheltered. Um, I did hear of a place up near Emu Bay, which has goon and stuff like that, and that might be a little further inland. We'll, we'll find out. Anyway, so we'll check that out. Keep you updated. So we're at uh, Emu Bay Lavender Farm. Stopped in for lunch or afternoon tea. It's really windy. Like, really. How is it, Miranda? <laughs> you might have a little bit of something. <laughs> so right now we are in a place called Discovery Lagoon, which is near Emu Bay. As you can probably tell, I'm looking pretty tired and or well rested right now. That's because I just had an amazing nap after having no sleep due to the wind last night. We decided to get something a little special and something that maybe flaps less than the wind. <laughs> we have a little cottage! <laughs> Pretty cute! And we're on our own here! Yeah, so we're gonna go for a walk and... These wetlands here. Yeah, there's a... It's called the Discovery Lagoon for a reason. It's because there's a lagoon here. We're gonna see if we can spot some echidnas. Unfortunately, no echidnas, but the bird life was awesome and the domestic animals seemed very friendly. So we're at the historic Reeves Point settlement named after one of the early settlers here on Kangaroo Island, uh, just outside of Kingscote. And the, it was actually the first settlement on the island. It was established in 1836 and it was supposed to be a whaling and fishing port, but the settlement itself actually failed. And by 1839, they pretty much packed up and went back onto the mainland. That was mainly due to a lack of fresh water and also the chaotic winds that we've been experiencing the last few days. And the island itself has a reputation for really ferocious wind. So yeah, it was kind of like a, a failure, but later on people resettled the area and agriculture became one of the big industries here on Kangaroo Island. Where are we? Kangaroo Island Brewery. And what are we about to do? Get pizzas and you beer. Yeah. Here's your new friend, Chicken. Let's do it, you must It's really sweet. So we've got Barney down here, little terror, and we've got Leela up here. <laughs> so it's uh, Kangaroo Island Brewery and I've uh, got myself an amber ale here. I was looking at the uh, tasting notes and it says that it's 5%. Lovely coloured beer with caramel flavors. Really, really nice. But I just noticed the on-tap one is 8.4%. I've got to drive later. <laughs> um, we've got pizzas coming shortly. And uh, also as well, just reading a little bit about the place. We started in 2015 and the building is made of timber and corrugated um, iron. And they also get all the water for the, from the beer from the roof. So it's rainwater essentially. And it all runs in solar power here, which is pretty cool. So we're 
we have just crossed the ferry from Kangaroo Island here to the Florio Peninsula on the mainland of Australia. We're in a place called Victor Harbour right now and we're about to go check out the local farmers markets which is on every Saturday. Yes. And uh, after that we're heading out to a place called Kurong National Park for the evening. favorite stand. Good morning. Hi. How are you? Sounds pretty cool for a little small town market. Mm -hmm. Got some Greek donuts here. <laughs> I've got the actual name of them now. Tagli something, I don't know. <laughs> Miranda got herself veg lasagna. Yep. And? And a brownie. <laughs> and a brownie. I didn't know she was getting a brownie and I ordered donuts so she doubled up on the dessert for breakfast. I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> Totally healthy. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so we're gonna head up uh, towards Kurong National Park and we might do some little walks this afternoon. So we are here in Kurong National Park, which is a massive national park, 50,000 hectares, stretches 145 kilometers along the coast here of uh, southeastern South Australia. Um, it's known for its spectacular scenery, sand dunes everywhere, wetlands and salt lakes. Also as well, it's abundance of wildlife. So you've got fish, reptiles, mammals, and of course, bird species, over 200 species of birds that nest in this area alone. So it's pretty spectacular. We're about to undertake the lake's nature walk, which goes around the Pipe Clay Lake. And it's about a three kilometer hike, give or take. So it should be about an hour, give or take, doing this hike. So we're heading out to the Chinaman's Well here in Kurong National Park and it's a little bit of a testament to the Chinese that came out here in the 1850s. They arrived in Port Adelaide in hopes of search for gold. Uh, the gold was in the Victorian Highlands, 800 kilometers away, so they essentially had to walk that distance. The reason why they arrived in Port Adelaide was because of a tax that was imposed in Victoria for Chinese immigrants and that was basically their way of avoiding that 10 pound tax. So through harsh conditions, through deserts, scrub, wetlands like this, completely foreign environments, they made their way to the Victorian gold fields. And this is really, as I said, a testament to their willpower. They never move this fast on the road. <laughs> That's a woman right there, muscle woman. Yeah. Will's beach shack. Whew. Wendy, we were showering tonight. The beach shower. <laughs> There's one here. He is a shingle back. All right, Chicky, what are we having for dinner? Tacos. Tacos. And guac as an appetizer. What's the most important part though? Cooking on the campfire. This is the best way to make our taco mix. Let's see how it's going right now. Oh yeah. Alright, that's the final result of the campfire tacos. How are they, Miranda? Oh, they're delicious. They're delicious? Coming up in the next episode, we head east via the Blue Lake in Mount Gambier and cross the border into Victoria. 
There we take on the world famous Great Ocean Road with its dramatic coastline and cliff formations, including the iconic Twelve Apostles. We explore the ancient rainforest and redwood forest of Great Otway National Park, meeting some of the native locals along the way. Upon our return to civilization, we embraced the amazing food and metropolitan lifestyle of Melbourne, Australia's culture capital. Heading into the Yarra, we learn a bit about the native fauna at the Hillsville Wildlife Sanctuary. Before driving through the scenic Blackspur Drive into the Victorian Highlands on our way to the New South Wales border. Join us on Global Travel Stories. At Global Travel Stories, we want to hear what you'd like to see more of. Please leave a comment below and remember to like and subscribe for our big adventures coming soon.